Here at NYX TV Repair, we have fixed well over a thousand Sony TVs. This video is a collection of all of the most common faults and repairs that we perform for both the XBR and XR series between 2015 and 2020. This collection of video repairs is organized by the TV's manufacturing date as well as from low end to high end. You will want to check out the video description below to help you navigate this long video. Each segment is timestamped and labeled by the TV's model number to make it easier to navigate. If you found the video helpful or useful, make sure to leave us a like and subscribe. And if you found it really useful, you can always leave us a super thanks. All right, enjoy. In this video, I will be going over a few of the common symptoms we see with Sony's 4K XBR series. The models we will be focused on today are the XBR-55X900C, XBR-65X900C, and XBR-75X910C. We will cover non blink code failures as well as the 7 and 8 blink code failures. For our 2 blink error code video, click on the link in the top left corner of the screen. And for our 4 and 6 blink error code video, click on the link in the top right corner of the screen. Okay, let's get the 7 and 8 code failures out of the way first. 7 blinks is triggered by an over temperature protection. This means the main board is detecting an IC is overheating or malfunctioning. Sometimes this is due to the main processor, sometimes it is due to any number of small surface mount components. Either way, this is a mainboard specific failure code. Eight blinks, according to Sony, is a software error. Now, we've actually never seen one of these mainboards with an eight blink error code before, but we have seen hundreds of them with software issues without triggering eight blinks. If you're experiencing a software failure, this would be a symptom our mail in repair service would cover. Again, you can find the repair service listing linked in the description below. Now, the remaining symptoms we will go over are also mainboard related. These failures, however, do not actually cause any blinking codes due to the way the board failed. The board is not able to identify itself as a defective part in the TV, but of course is still the issue. Now the symptoms. Number one, the TV seems completely dead. The TV will not power on, nor does it respond to the buttons on the remote, the buttons on the back of the TV, and the standby light never turns on. So essentially it seems like it has the same amount of functionality as if it were unplugged. Number two. When turning on the TV, the pilot light will show a white light for about five seconds or so, and then shut off. Sometimes it will cycle back on and repeat the process. Sometimes it will stay off. We've also seen it show a dark blue, almost purple light as well. Number three, and this is the most common mainboard failure we see on these TVs, and it it's similar to number two, but this time the TV turns on, shows the Android logo, and then shuts off and repeats that cycle endlessly. A lot of people will refer to that as the boot loop issue or the boot loop error. Number four, the TV turns on, boots past the logo, but none of the HDMI ports work. All of the failures and symptoms we just covered are all mainboard failures. I have a Sony XBR 55X A50C. When I plug it in and power it on, we get no power. That's the most common symptom. Alternatively, we often see boot looping or cycling. And then we also see slow to navigate menus and sometimes it'll intermittently freeze. So let's open it up and find out what's going on. Having fixed over a thousand Sony boards in the past, I know that the issue is gonna be the main board, but if you wanna confirm that your power supply is not at fault and causing this no power issue that we're currently experiencing, you can check the 12 volt line going to the main board as well as the standby voltage. Now there is a 12 volt line for the T-Con, but that will typically not activate until the main board is fixed. So if you're not getting 12 volts to the T-Con, that's okay as long as you're getting 12 volts to the main board. Now the three symptoms we covered, which are the no power, the cycling or boot looping, and then the slow to navigate menus or intermittent freezing are all caused by this chip over here. That is the eMMC chip and it holds all of the software for the TV. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass the board over to my tech Juan for him to replace. All right Juan, I have a Sony main board for you to fix. All right, so I've already put some flux on here and I'm gonna get ready to remove the old solder. All right, we're gonna check out the EMMC that we pulled off of the board. See what the life report is. 
Uh, there you have it right there. It says the health report is very bad, 50-60% device lifetime used. That's probably why the TV wasn't booting. Looks like it's all good. There you go. Thank you, Juan. So we'll go ahead and plug it in. All right, and we have our Sony logo show up. So I didn't press any power buttons or on the remote or on the buttons on the TV. It looks like it's powering up on its own. And I do want to wait for it to boot through the Android logo because as we stated, that is one of the common issues that we see from a defective EMMC. And so it loaded pretty quickly. Typically when you have that issue, it'll take a lot longer to load or it will be stuck on that, uh, the Android logo forever. And we just plugged in our Fire Stick to check, make sure the audio and the video is working properly. And it is. So if you found the video helpful, useful, leave us a like and subscribe and thank you for watching. In this video, we're gonna be covering how to disable the error line for the backlight. Uh, in this video specifically, we're using a 55X 900C TV, but it is actually something you can do with a lot of the Sony uh, LED TVs, XBR models, the KDL models, 1080p, 4K. Um, so the legit fix would really be to be replacing LED strips when you get a four and a six blink error code, uh, but this is a cheap, very quick trick that you can do to avoid the hassle of completely disassembling the TV and replacing those LEDs. So in this video here, we have the LED driver on screen and uh, we're going to be going ahead and removing the error code pin, um, the wire that connects the power supply to the LED driver and we're going to go ahead and ground it out so that the error can no longer be seen or identified by the main board. So we're going to do a voltage measurement and we're measuring pin 2 right now and we have 2.39 volts. So that means that it is detecting a fault. And because of that, right now we're getting that four and or six blink error code. On our example here, pin two is our BL error. If you have a different model TV, your backlight error pin might be a different pin number, such as six or eight. Okay, so we just unplugged the TV. We're just making sure that the voltages are going down. We're gonna go ahead and unplug the clip. We're gonna flip it over. And we're actually going to completely remove that wire. Uh, so essentially you have to try and get some tweezers to lift up a little plastic tab that uses a, a locking mechanism to hold that pin in. So as you're lifting the plastic, you can remove the wire. And we're gonna go ahead and put in, in number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and put it in pin nine, which is uh, I believe our ground. So right now what we're doing was we're actually grounding out that error line uh, so that it cannot send a signal to the main board and then default to that four to six blanks. So we just plugged it back in. Now, since the connector is now missing that line, we're not gonna have any voltages on that line anymore. And let's go ahead and check the line itself. So this is essentially we're doing a measurement to ground and we're making sure there is no voltage. So essentially at this moment, we've just disabled that error. And because of that, your TV should now turn on and no longer bring up that four or six blinking error code. And you should be able to enjoy it for at least a, a few more months to a couple more years before the LED failure becomes too severe, uh, at which point you will have to completely replace those LED strips. I have a Sony model XBR 65X 900C here today, and the common issues we see are the TV has no power, completely dead. Sometimes it will turn on, show the Sony logo, and then it will turn off and back on, do that cycle endlessly. Sometimes it will boot past the Sony logo, it'll show you the Android logo, but then we'll shut off and of course repeat that endlessly. Those are the most common issues we see with the XBR 900C models, and we're going to be showing you how to fix that. Okay, so it just got stuck. Now it shuts off and then it's gonna turn back on. There we go. And it just does that endlessly. So let's go ahead and get the main board out of the TV and show you how to fix it. We'll also have a video linked on how to remove the main board if you're having any issues with that. 
For the common faults we described earlier, which are the completely dead no power, the cycling, or if it just loads the Android logo endlessly, those are gonna be faults we cannot use a multimeter to detect. The reason for it is because this is a software failure. The software failure is coming from this chip over here, which is called our eMMC chip. It holds all the software, it's defective, and needs to be replaced. So we're gonna be putting a brand new chip on there with fresh factory default software, and that should fix it. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so Nick is handing me the Sony board and we're gonna replace the eMMC. All right, and now we wait. Five minutes later. Looks like we've reached temperature. We can now begin to remove the EMMC. We'll go ahead and add some flux to this so we can go ahead and clean the old solder off. All right, and you want to make sure it locks right in. It looks like it's aligned properly. And we'll begin the process of reattachment. Five minutes later. We've reached temperature and the EMMC has settled in. We'll go ahead and wait for this board to cool and then we'll hand it back to Nick. We just installed the main board back into the TV, so let's plug it in and see what happens. I just heard a click. We have our Sony logo, which we did before. So now we have the Android logo, which again, we did have before. And unfortunately in the past, it would stop here, cycle off and back on. And now it's booting all the way through to the end of the Android logo. So I think we're okay here. I just wanna wait till we see the HDMI one. There we go. All right, so it looks like we have a proper repair. We were able to successfully fix the cycling issue by replacing the EMMC on this main board. If you have a circuit board that is having that fault, we'll have more information on how you can send us your board for repair in the description down below. If you have a amber and green light flashing at the bottom, which you may, you will want to watch the video at the bottom next, which will show you how to pair the main board to the TV. If you have other faults like a four or six blank error code, you'll check out the top one and that'll show you exactly how to fix that. If you found the content helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I have a Sony model XBR65X900C, which is experiencing the four and six blink error code. So this is an LED strip fault, and we're gonna be showing you today how to replace those LED strips. We do have a quick trick video available that'll be in the top right corner, but that one is only how to disable the six blink code and is not necessarily a proper fix. This video will go way more in depth on how to properly fix that problem. So if you do try that trick and it does not work or you have the flashing, like we're gonna show you here in a second, this is gonna be the video for you. So I just turned it on a second ago and it takes a moment to boot up. Okay, so at first the picture looks okay. Uh, with this model specifically, the bottom left corner starts going dim after a few seconds. It just did right now. And then typically a few seconds later, we get some intermittent blinking, okay? And then eventually shuts off and we get either a four or a six blink error code. We've already done a video on how to open up the back cover. So if you wanna check that one out, it's gonna be in the top right. So we've also just removed the main board. If you don't know how to do that or if you're having any troubles with the clips, you can check out another video we have in the top right corner as well. So our next step is going to be removing a lot of the accessories and other parts of the TV that are currently on top of this silver shield. The LED strips are behind it, so between the screen and the silver shield. So we're gonna start by removing some of the speakers uh, and some of the shrouds that are on top and preventing us from accessing some of the screws. I'm gonna start by removing the plastic shroud over here. The screws are a little bit smaller, so I did have to replace and swap out the drill bits. So we'll go ahead and get these out. Let's see, and this should wiggle out as well. We'll go ahead and do the same on the other side now. Another one here. And there are tons of screws, so you're gonna wanna make sure to kinda keep them all together for each section. Like I separated out between each section, but each section together. 
otherwise it's very easy to lose track. We have one screw here for the smaller speaker, same over here. And there's a lot of tape holding these different wires down. We're gonna wanna keep them when we put everything back together. But we do need to remove all the wiring, it'll be a lot easier. So we have four speaker screws. They're on the outsides and the outsides. So to release this clip over here, we have a little tab we have to push in right here, and then I can lift it up, and that'll release the wires. I guess we have more tape here as well. All right. And I'm gonna keep this screw with the speaker screw since that kind of all goes together. We're gonna also remove the IR and Bluetooth. So now the buttons, wires, the IR, Bluetooth, everything's coming out in one piece. Our next step is gonna be the T-Con board. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the clip right here and the two ribbons. So these you have to press on the sides and wiggle out. We'll remove the tape. So we'll keep these pieces together and it's giving me a little resistance. I think we have another thermal pad, right? Yep, so that's why it's a little sticky, so just be gentle with it. Okay, so we're disconnecting the ribbon going from the T-Con board to the address boards. Actually, it might be easier to remove from the T-Con because it has a little more slack and then pull it from here. We can just reconnect the T-Con side for now. So if you do disconnect the T-Con side, just make sure you line it up correctly. In order to remove the two bars that cover the address boards, we're gonna have to remove this piece here. And that holds the screen together, I believe, uh, with uh, nice and tight with the, um, the LED strips. All right, so this part should just wiggle and slide out. Okay, and now we can go ahead and remove the covers to the address boards. And we do have to remove these pieces that are holding it down. So the reason for is because we need to lift it from this side first. and then we can kind of wiggle it out a little bit. There's a couple clips on the bottom here. There we go, that hold it in here. So that's why we can't lift from the bottom, we have to lift from the top. Next step is going to be removing all of these little aluminum screws that are all around this uh, chassis. And you do want to be careful and want to make sure you have the correct bits because these are very fragile. I believe they're aluminum screws. So aluminum is a very fragile and if you're using the wrong bit you will strip them and it'll make this very difficult. I think we're all set. So the last few sets of screws are below the address boards. So we'll flip these over like this. And again, we're, gonna, we're very gentle here. This is probably the most fragile part of the TV. So you wanna be very careful. And our last set of screws are hidden here below the blackout tape. So let's go ahead and lift this up. Nope, that's not lifting. Um, okay, I am noticing, so these screws don't technically need to come off, but this one does have a washer that is larger than the gap. So I'm gonna have to remove this bottom one here. And now so I'm realizing there's one more piece of tape right on the corner we need to remove. And that should release this whole aluminum platform here. We have all of our screws out. Uh, we've removed the tape. 
and when I try to pull this out, it's giving me a lot of resistance. So I actually, I went and double checked and I made sure we, we don't have any more screws or tape, but it is giving me still a lot of resistance. So I'm kind of just gently wiggling it out. And I don't believe there actually is anything else holding it in. I think it's just, it's just lodged in there really well. And this side comes out a little easier. There we go. And I'm being very careful right here because this is where our LEDs are. So let's lift all this up now. Should be free. All right, so these are our three LED strips, two on each side, one in the center. Let's go ahead and remove them. So again, we have lots of screws. All right, now we're gonna remove the Kapton tape. We're gonna be squeezing each side here, and that's not gonna be enough because the cable is also taped down, or, or it's some sort of adhesive below the, the wires. So I'm gonna try and lift it up a little bit here, get my nails underneath, and then pinch, and then gently wiggle and remove. So as you can tell, there's this adhesive kind of preventing the cable from moving. All right, this should now lift off. So all three of these are going to be kind of more or less connected by that adhesive piece, uh, rubber piece that was what I was saying maybe holding down the whole thing. So we're going to cut it. There we go. We'll move them to the side and get our new strips, which we will have a link in the description. We'll have these available for sale in our store. Because the LEDs stand off of the board, it does make this strip very fragile, so you do have to be very careful when handling them. And then we'll connect this in. Okay, so when I'm plugging these in, I am not getting a satisfying click sound, but I do believe they are in correctly because I can't push it in any further than it already is. Now we're gonna flip it all back over and put it back in. This is the most difficult part of the whole process. I've rarely been able to actually do this 100% the first try. I usually have to kind of take it back off, put it back on a couple times. For some reason, the alignment is very tricky. Everything looks flush. And that was actually on my first try. Wow, all right. So we'll start with uh, putting the aluminum screws back on down here. And I'm going on the lowest torque setting here on the drill. So I guess, yeah, let me kind of go over more in detail. So the reason I was saying that typically I don't get this right on the first try is because it seems like everything's lined up correctly. And yet, um, like the center will be raised up a little higher and I can't even screw in the screws because they're sitting just a little too high. They won't actually grab the thread on the other side. Um, and that's because I think the LEDs are just not lined up correctly on the screen. So maybe it's because the LED strips aren't always lined up right. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but on this, this one go around, I was able to get on the first try. So if, if you don't get it, you might have to readjust your LED strips. Maybe they're not put in correctly. We have these two side screws. And then we're gonna bend the address boards back up here. And I think right now is probably our best time to reattach the ribbon. Okay, and actually, let's do it this way. So I'm gonna completely remove the ribbon, and the reason for it is it's actually a lot harder to attach it down here than it is up here because I have this little tab I can use. I don't have that down here. So zooming in here, we can see there's a little bit of a dotted line, and it lines up perfectly with this clip. So if that dotted line is not perfect, then you may not have properly inserted the ribbon, and you may have to do it again. So now we'll be putting the metal covers back on top. And if we recall, we had to lift from the top, which means when we're putting these back down, we're gonna have to put them from the bottom. So I have these pieces of tape here that are covering the clips that it's gonna lock into. So I want to remove those out of the way, otherwise it won't clip in correctly. All right, 
So actually, in order for it to properly fit, I had to, my table doesn't come all the way out to the screen, so the screen is sagging a little bit. I actually had to slightly push the screen back up for all of it to connect properly. But now I know and can see that it is connected properly. So we're all set there. Let's go ahead and screw the top down. We'll do this edge one. So I believe our next piece is the bottom bar here. Okay, just wanna make sure everything seems right or feels right. Okay, the bar is not quite, maybe it'll settle in. So the bar is not coming in extremely flush, but I do remember that when I was unscrewing it, it was kind of bending a little bit. So once we screw the screws in, it should be better. And I'm actually gonna do the other one on the opposite side. And then just start working my way in. Now we're gonna go back to the T-Con board. Right, so the T-Con board, we gotta clear these cables and wires out of the way. That lines up perfectly. And we have six screws, three on each side. And so these two, then this guy goes on top. And the final screw, the seventh one, goes right here. Yeah. I said six, three on each side, and I felt I had seven. A little confusing, but here we go. So before we put this down, we have the aluminum screws. So we'll put those back down. And then we can put this back over. So typically, when I do LED strip repairs, I like to, at some point, turn them on, make sure that they're all functioning before I put everything back together. Um, otherwise, if I do and then find that I made a mistake, I have to undo everything and start over from scratch. I am not doing that here with this one because the main board um, needs to be connected in. And I guess this is uh, probably a good time to do it. Um, but if you try to turn it on with the main board disconnected from the screen or from the T-Con board, it's going to desync or unpair the main board. So you wanna make sure that your screen, your T-Con board, and your main board are all connected together. Otherwise, when you turn the TV on, if you have the screen disconnected or the T-Con disconnected, it's gonna throw the amber green fault, meaning it needs to pair. Uh, but now we are kind of at a point where we don't necessarily need to go further. Uh, we probably could have checked it a little bit earlier once the um, address boards were connected back into the T-Con. Technically, we didn't have to put all the shrouds back on, but if we did not put these shrouds back on, the screen would not necessarily be properly lined up, and we could have some um, light bleed, which would make us think that maybe something's not lined up right, when in fact just the shroud uh, or this metal bar was just not installed. <clears throat> So I haven't really installed this correctly. I'm just making sure that there's no metal sitting on top of any of the circuit boards. That's really my only concern right now. But at this point, we have the main board back in. I only have a couple screws. Uh, everything that needs to be connected is connected. So let's power it on. So it's plugged in. Let me press the power button. Okay. And we have our screen. So yeah, at this point we did start getting some flickering to occur, and right now we're not getting any flickering, and we're not getting any four or six blinks like we were getting before. Okay, and we're on HDMI one, and it looks like we have good picture, no flickering, and no blinking code. All right. But at least we know it works, and we don't have any problems with the way we've set things up so far. All right, and if I recall, we had four screws, it was on the outside. I'm 
And now we're gonna finish up the aluminum screws. And I think there are two that are hidden behind the main board. So in order to get those, we'll have to backtrack a little bit. So I missed one under the wires right over here. And I realized that this is actually a, a piece that's more easily installed uh, when the main board, or removed when the main board is actually not in the system. So typically, the easier way to do this is having the main board removed uh, before we put this piece. But I guess I like to do things the hard way. So let's try to line up some of these wires back under the tape where they belong. This one over here went into this clip. We had these pieces. So what I'm thinking is actually, we're gonna have to remove these four screws and it should make it a little easier for us to slide this where it belongs. Yeah, that's a lot easier. All right, and then this piece, let's see, slides similar fashion. All right, for that last one. So this is able to slide, and that's one of the locking mechanisms for the, removing the back cover. And then this last one goes right here, locking in the buttons. So same on this side. We're gonna remove these four screws. This should slide on. All right, we're plugged in. Let me go ahead and turn it on. And final check, it's still turning on. So one thing I am noticing is Regardless of my angle, I am definitely seeing a little bit of light bleed. So the reason we're getting light bleed is because this little black foam strip that we have in front of the LEDs on the original strips but do not have on the replacements. So this little foam strip I've tried to remove. Unfortunately, the adhesive on the back is no longer sticky, so I can't use this one and put it on the replacements. We have tried finding and buying some replacement strip for the new LEDs, but unfortunately have not been able to find any adequate replacements. We've talked to other techs, they're also coming up empty handed. So if you have any information on this, let us know in the comments down below. We'd love to hear from you and know where we might be able to find this replacement piece. Otherwise, if you found the video helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. Full disclaimer, this video is officially over regardless if this board works or not. This is definitely a board that's not worth fixing. <laughs>I'm gonna show you how to fix this completely dead Sony mainboard. The customer sent it in, stating that their TV one day just stopped working. So our first step is plug it into our test jig and confirm the fault. Now typically after about 10 or 15 seconds, we are supposed to be getting our standby light, as well as I do have a flash drive with an LED light on it that is supposed to light up once the TV gets the five volts. And lastly, our optical light is also supposed to turn on. None of those three lights are currently turning on, thus confirming that this main board is not turning on and activating as it should and is indeed the fault. Now there is something else going on with this main board that we haven't told you about yet, but first let's go ahead and take a look at it at our test bench. The most common cause of the dead no power symptom is the EMMC chip. The easiest way to diagnose it is to remove it and install it into our memory diagnostic tool. to 
check the life on this MMC. That's probably the cause of the dead Sony. Now we'll go ahead and remove this EMMC and put a good one in here and we'll begin to program it. Programming can take between 15 to 20 minutes, so in the meantime, let's finish prepping the board. We are now ready to install our newly programmed chip. Now typically after replacing the EMMC chip, we would be live testing the board in our test jig. However, we did not tell you earlier that the customer had claimed the HDMI ports stopped functioning before the TV went completely dead. Now that can commonly be caused by the HDMI processor right here, and often it will short out. So before we live test the board, let's make sure there are no shorts on the HDMI processor. For this board, I wanna focus on the top right corner, and more specifically, this large capacitor right here. And I'm getting about 1.7 ohms. That's a short. Now on our good board over here, this board is showing 24.31 kilo ohms, and this is a known good working board. So we'll go ahead and replace the IC chip, and then recheck the capacitor for shorts. I've been preheating the main board with our bottom heat at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of flux. And with my heat gun, we're gonna be doing about 375 Celsius at 100% air. Okay, we're having a little bit of a hard time. I'm gonna bump it up to 400. Starting to get a little give. There we go. And while the board is hot, using my desolder wick, I'm going to remove the excess solder left behind. And now just a little cleaning. Now that the chip is removed, let's recheck our resistance. And I am getting OL, so open loop. For these large chips that have the large ground pads, we always wanna put some solder paste first. And I think I've mastered the art of not putting too much. Yeah, that still looks like a lot. And this is what the solder paste looks like when we're zoomed in all the way. All right, let's go ahead and line up our chip best we can. So the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna put a big blob of solder on my tip bring that down on the board in a way that I don't actually touch the actual chip or the pins or the board, but hopefully solder the actual chip down. So now, in theory, it should be locked in on those, I guess not one, but four or so pins. And if I adjust the chip up here, yep, I'm getting some resistance now. So I can go ahead and lock in this top left pin. Actually, before we start soldering, I did notice we have a couple bent pins, like the one down here. So we'll wanna go ahead and straighten those out first. And it usually is gonna be those corner pins that get hit. We do have a lot of excess, so let's go ahead and remove that with our desolder wick. So actually, we're gonna just tack down a few more pins on this side, and finally the right side. So the reason we're going quickly and we're not doing a perfect job is because I still need to actually solder down the centerpiece, the grounding pad with the hot air. And if I get everything perfect, it might get undone while I do the hot air. So I just wanna get a few of the pins down first. All right, so we're gonna be doing the same amount of heat. And I'm gonna be pressing down a little bit with my tool. And I think we've actually already reached temperature here. All right, and now I can go ahead and perfect my soldering. And this is our final side, which I don't remember if I did a rake check yet, so let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, perfect. I did remember we soldered it, but I didn't remember if we had checked it. Before we check the capacitor, let's go ahead and do a little cleanup. There's a lot of flux everywhere. And we're getting about 34.8 kilo ohms. 
So now our short is gone, we're getting an appropriate reading. Now we can go ahead and life test it. I've already plugged everything back in, so we're just gonna apply power and wait a few seconds, checking our IR and our light here on the USB as well as the optical. Now by now I would have expected the flash drive to start illuminating and same with the standby, but we're not getting anything. Power button is not responsive. So it looks like we must have missed something. Let's go ahead and just bring it back to the test bench. Unfortunately, we weren't able to finish this repair yesterday, but after a little bit more time, we were able to identify the fault here with the board. Similarly to a recent video, if we take a look at the ethernet port, we'll notice the resistor bank on the bottom right is burnt. So this is what it looks like up close. And this is what it's supposed to look like on a good board. Now what this means is that this board, the TV that it came from, was hit by a lightning strike via the ethernet port. This is not information we were made aware of, and I did it off screen, but after we did the silicon image replacement, I did check the processor, and I did not find any shorts whatsoever. Because we did have a lightning strike enter through the ethernet port, however, it does mean that our processor is most likely damaged, even though I didn't find any shorts, so our next step is gonna be to replace that next. All right, Juan, I have yet another rework for you. Again? Yeah. All right. Full disclaimer, this video is officially over regardless if this board works or not because I'm pretty tired of working on this board. So hopefully it works and it's not. Oh, yeah. We have, our flash drive is turning on. I actually thought it wasn't gonna work. And will our standby light and optical turn on? Oh my God, the optical's on, yes. Yes, it works. Oh my God. Thank God. Whew. All right, so the ethernet's not working still even after replacing that resistor. And I fear that there's some inductors and additional resistor banks that need to be replaced, but we're already getting to the end of the day. So we'll just go ahead and check for now our HDMI ports since we haven't been able to do that since the HDMI processor replacement. And we have our fire stick working. If you found the video helpful or useful, make sure to leave us a like and subscribe and thank you for watching. I have a Sony with model number XBR65X850D, and when I plug it in, I get no power. The standby light does not turn on. So let's open it up and find out what's going on. And as well, I have a video on how to open it up in the top right corner. So we just removed the back cover. Everything is still connected, and we just plugged in the TV back to power. So let's do some voltage checks. I have my negative lead to ground, and looking at the legend over here, it says the third pin on the bottom row is our standby 3.3 volts. So let's go ahead and give that a check. And as you can tell on the multimeter, we do have that standby voltage. And I wanna check also our 12 volt line, which if we look over here is the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth pin on the bottom. So we'll check those down here. Oh, I'm not making contact, let me try again. Okay, here we go. And as we can see, we have the 12.8 volts. So what that means is our power supply is providing power to the main board, but the main board is not allowing the set to turn on completely, and also is not allowing the standby light to even turn on. Now, we did do a diagnostic and we did confirm the power supply is providing power to the main board, but something I do want to mention is a no power for the 55 and 65 inch models of the 850D series. I have never seen a power supply fail. Typically it is the main board. So let's take a closer look and see what could be going on with that main board. We have three items that could cause an issue. Number one would be the main processor that's located under the heatsink. Number two would be the HDMI processor to the right. And lastly, the EMMC, which is the chip that holds the software. This is the most common failure. However, it is also very difficult to identify. So we're gonna do by process elimination, check these two chips for shorts, making sure that everything's okay there. And if it is, then we'll know the EMMC needs to be replaced. So let's start by removing the heatsink. We'll flip the board over. Where are my pliers? And we have four pins holding in the heatsink. We'll go ahead and pinch them and push them through. 
All right. And now we're going to focus on some of the capacitors around the processor. Now, because the processor does not have any exposed pins, we're going to be checking some of the capacitors around it for shorts. And of course, the capacitors themselves are not supposed to be shorted. So if we do detect a short, it will be because the processor itself is shorted. So let's check over here and see we have 5.6 kilo ohms. We'll check this one over here. 1.3 kilo ohms. Let's check a couple of the small ones on the right side. Oh, and I think I detected something, but I could have actually just been slipping with my lead and making improper contact. All right, and we are getting 3.7, so that's better. We'll do another random check over here. And this one is showing about 35 kilo ohms, which I was not expecting the processor to go out. Typically, that only happens if there's a lightning strike, which if we do see that happening, usually the silicon image chip, which is the HDMI processor, is the one that will be affected first. Now, when that happens, we will see zero ohm uh, on the capacitors around it. So we'll do the same thing and we'll do a couple of random capacitor checks. And I know that these capacitors are supposed to be shown around 35 ohms and 33.6, so that's close enough. 33.8, 35.5, we'll check a couple more, 39.6. All right, so we know that the silicon image, the HDMI processor chip is not shorted, so that is not the issue, which means then by process of elimination, our EMMC over here will need to be replaced. So let's go ahead and get that started. I just had my technician Juan finish the EMMC replacement on the main board. And if you want more details on how we do that, you can check out our video in the top right corner. So we installed it back in, we put the TV back together and we should be seeing our standby light turning on here. Hey, perfect, look at that. So the TV just turned on, we have a picture, which of course we did not before. So we'll go ahead and do some further checks, but right now it looks like we have a successful repair. If you like the video, if you like the content, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I have a Sony model XBR55X 850D and it's having a HDMI no signal fault. I currently have a Fire Stick plugged into HDMI 4 and it's showing no signal, it's not detecting the device. When I bring up the inputs, typically over here, we're supposed to have a little symbol indicating it is detecting a device is plugged in and that's not the case right now, even though the device is plugged in. Now that we've removed the back cover, we can tell there's not actually much going on aside from the main board. We're gonna be focusing on that circuit board and more specifically on the HDMI processor located right there. So let's go ahead and remove it out of the TV and take a look at it under the microscope. So we have our HDMI ports two, three, and four on the side. And as you can tell, we have these traces here that go directly from the HDMI all the way to the HDMI processor. So this HDMI processor, which is made by Silicon Image, is most likely our fault, and we're going to be checking some of the caps around it for shorts. So the reason we do that is because if the caps around it are shorted, it means that actually the chip is the, the real fault, the real short. So for example, looking at this resistor right here, we are getting a beep, which indicates a short or a resistance lower than 50. So this one is in the mega ohms, so we don't have a short on those lines here. That one's 31 ohms, which is also a little bit on the low side, but it's actually not too bad. That could be considered with intolerance. This one's 30 ohms. Like I said, we're supposed to be seeing about 40 to 50. And 30, 1.35, 45 kilo ohms. So those are actually good. 33, I was expecting a lot more shorts. There's like no shorts. There's literally only one so far out of the six caps I've checked. And this one over here is showing us 30, 30. Right. So it looks like only a small portion of the chip is shorted. We just checked a lot of those capacitors and most of them are actually testing more or less with intolerance, although 30 ohms is a little bit on the low side, that's definitely suspicious. Uh, but that 10, 15 ohms over here on those two, that's definitely too low. So to me, that is an indicator that the silicon image has shorted and needs to be replaced. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna start off by adding some flux to all of the pins here. I have it currently on a bottom heater to add some heat, of course, from the bottom. Um, the reason for is there's a large ground pad in the center below that chip. And I'm going to be using, because of that, my hot air 
to remove it. So I'm using about 375 degrees Celsius and we're gonna be doing about 20 or 30 seconds of hot air. Okay, I'm starting to prod and lift it slowly. Getting heat on all my corners here. There we go. It's a lot of smoke from the flux. So if you have it available, I highly recommend using a fume extractor. And I don't know if you saw it, but I did accidentally knock a capacitor right here. So we're gonna have to readjust that. So ideally I should have probably attacked it from this side because there are fewer capacitors, smaller chance for a mistake on that corner. And now while I still have a good amount of heat, I'm going to be using my desolder wig to remove all of the excess solder left over on the pads. And I just actually just cut off a small piece instead of using the whole roll. It'll make it a little easier for me here. And then because I'm left-handed, I'm just rotating the board 90 degrees to do this last side. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do a little cleanup, remove a lot of that old flux that's burnt up, and we're gonna put some new flux here in a second. And if you forgot to check the orientation, there should be clues left on the board. So for example, the, the, the chip, chip is gonna be marked with a little dot over here, and the board itself will also have a little dot down over here. So I'm just putting some solder paste on our ground plane over here. And what this solder paste is, is essentially just tiny, tiny little solder balls kind of mixed in with some flux. And that'll allow us to solder the bottom ground pad to the board. And we're gonna put our chip down. So now this is gonna be a little bit more uh, in-depth micro soldering. So we're gonna change cameras. Before I use my hot air to solder this down, I want to make sure it is perfectly lined up. Spending an extra five minutes making sure it's properly lined up will save 20 minutes of hassle down the line. So one thing I'm looking at here is this side is not lined up correctly. The bottom is, but the uh, the left and right side are not. It's a little it's sitting a little high. So we're gonna slide it down just a smidge. I'm going very slow. And I think that looks good. So it is exactly where I want it. And one more thing I'm gonna do here is just tack down a couple of the corners or a couple of the pins. And the way I wanna do it is I wanna add solder to my iron and I want to solder it down without the iron actually making contact. So what I mean by without actually making contact is I'm putting a big blob of solder on my iron tip and I want that solder blob to touch the pins and the board, but I don't want the actual iron to touch the pins or the board because if it does, I'll cause it to move. There we go, perfect. So essentially the, the blob of solder I have is an extension of my iron. Oh, the whole board moved, not the chip. So that's okay. Now that we have it kind of tacked down a little bit, I'm gonna add flux just on those little spots. I'm not gonna add flux to the whole chip yet. We've been preheating the board for a few minutes now, so let's go ahead and hit it with some hot air. And I'm gonna be focusing my heat on the center of the chip for the most part, because that is the ground pad we're trying to solder right now. And we can see our solder is melting on the sides here. So that would be an indicator that we're getting pretty close to that temperature. The ground pad always takes a little bit more of heat, a little more heat. So we're gonna do a few more seconds. Actually, one more thing we're gonna do is, we're gonna take the opportunity right here. I'm gonna move that over. We're gonna try to double dip on what we do here. We need to fix these two caps. So we have this one here right there. And finally, we're gonna get to the pins, so let's go ahead and put some flux on those now, starting with just this side. And we're gonna start by brushing some of that solder over. And we have a couple bridges left over. I'm gonna try and fix 
There we go. And we have one more over here. Move it around a little bit. There we go. All right. So that looks pretty good. We'll come back to it and do a check later. Let's rotate the board over. And while we're here on this corner, we'll add a little solder here. That is much more than I wanted. And while we're at it, we're just gonna add flux everywhere. Let's see if we can remove a little bit of that excess. There we go. All right, that should be good for now. So same thing, I'm gonna try and bring this solder over. It is giving me a little bit of a harder time than the other side was. I'm not sure exactly why. Let's try a little more flux. Oh, you know what? I know why. I turned my bottom heater off a little earlier, so I have less assist, and heat transfer is key to all soldering. And I don't know if you can tell, let's zoom in a little more, but I'm getting solder on the pins, however, it's not connecting to the pad. So the solder is, I mean, I can see the shiny solder on the pin, but the pad is that still very dull. So I'm having to like push the pins down to kind of force that contact. So I don't know if maybe some of the pins on my chip are bent or if the uh, board is just not flush and it's warping a little bit from the heat, which can happen. But uh, I had to physically push down on some of those pins to make that proper contact. That does look good now. Let's rotate one more time. We have two more sides. So this side I did not have any solder so we'll have to add all fresh solder we'll do the same thing we'll, we'll start on one edge so to help make that better contact i'm going to be pressing down on the chip a little bit as i'm going over it with the iron hopefully that'll make it easier to get that good proper bond with the solder between the, the chips pins and the actual pads on the board. Yeah, and I think that's actually helping quite a bit. But I don't have quite enough solder. I'll have to add just a tiny little more. Hopefully that's enough. That's definitely a tiny bit. So we're gonna do a, a check with the dental tool on every single pin on all sides at the end. All right, our final side now. I'm just trying to spread it out a little bit here. When I flow and I go this way, I glide over the pins and I will not bend or hit any of them. If I go this way, my tip could actually get caught on one of the pins and bend it. Um, so going this way is actually very dangerous because if you solder a pin down bent, it can be very difficult to correct. All right, we're gonna use the this technique again. I just did it again, went the other way. So when I'm doing my little circles, this is okay because I'm actually going this way, not on the pins, then bring it back. This is essentially what I'm doing. I'll do a quick clean, just so it's easier to see what's going on. So now we're gonna go ahead and do our little scrape with the dental tool on each pin to make sure everything is properly soldered in. So if any of the pins bend right now, that means they're not soldered in properly. We're gonna to have to redo it. Good. Also good. And our final side, which I think this was the one that I was slightly questioning. And also good. All right, so we can go ahead and put it back in the TV. But before, I'm gonna do one last pass with the hot air, just over those caps. Um, I technically don't need to. They're fine as is, but 
they are bent and I don't know, I just want to make sure that there's 100% for sure good contact on these. I'm semi-questioning this side a little bit of that smaller cap. Okay, and it looks like we got good flow, so we're all set there. We've installed the main board back into the TV. We already have the fire stick plugged into HDMI port number four. So now we're just waiting for it to load up. And it's detecting fire TV stick, HDMI four. So that's a good sign. And we did not detect your remote, sure. All right, so we're getting the audio, we're getting the proper video. So we're all set, it looks like we have a proper repair. If you enjoyed the content, if you found it helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I have a 4K Sony TV that stopped working after a lightning strike, and I'm gonna plug it in, just show you what's going on. When I plug it in, we actually don't really get any power. The standby light never turns on, but when I check with my multimeter, the standby voltage that's going out of the power supply to the main board, we do get our 3.3 volts. My standby voltage is the third pin on the bottom row, and my other lead is already on chassis ground, and we get 3.4 volts, close enough to the 3.3, so that means my power supply is not affected. So now that we've confirmed the power supply still has output voltage to the main board, we're gonna do some closer looks on the main board itself. Typically with lightning strike or power surge issues, the main board is most likely to get affected, and usually the lightning strike or power surge will come in through the HDMI ports or through the ethernet. Now, I did take a closer look, and I actually am seeing some burning right over here so most likely the strike came in through the ethernet port. Now that we're zoomed in, it's very obvious that we have a lot of damage around the ethernet port and we can tell we have a resistor over here that is completely burned. A capacitor over here looks physically damaged on that corner, like a chunk is missing. And I'm sure there's more damage, but one thing I wanna do is just follow these traces and see where they go. So for example, here we'll follow these two, they go over here, over here, then they go down over here and then there are two points that go into the board so what this means is that actually it's going to pop up on the other side so we'll look for one two three four five in a row with one in front we'll flip the board and here we are we have one two three four with one in front so the top ones were the one we were following and we'll follow now it goes this way over here and again, right back through the board. So we'll look for these guys on the other side. And they pop right back up over here and then up into the heat under the heat sink where the processor is. So if we remove the heat sink, boom and boom. And we'll follow it again now that I removed the heat sink, but it goes right in under the processor chip here. So to confirm, I'm gonna put one of my leads here in beep mode, and we'll go back to here. And that is a short, so it indicates that we did follow that trace correctly. So that is a direct line to the processor, which means it was most likely affected and shorted in during the lightning strike or power surge. So let's take a look and see if there are shorts on any of the capacitors around it uh, to confirm whether or not the processor is shorted. And I've actually already done this, so I know exactly which ones to look at, but we have a capacitor right here. Nope, we have a capacitor right here. Yep, there it is. This one is showing a short. And this is a good board. When comparing off of this good board, we get 6.1, 6.2 mega ohms. So obviously not a short. So that confirms our processor is shorted and needs to be replaced. So our next step is bringing the board to the rework machine. We're gonna remove the processor, double check, confirm that the short is gone from that little capacitor down here, and then attach a new processor and put it back on the TV. Let's begin by adding a little bit of flux around the CPU. We'll start by positioning the top heat and the bottom heat. That looks like we've reached temperature and now I'm going to prod the chip. That looks good. All right, that looks like a good lift. We'll add a little bit of flux to make the process a little bit smoother. And you don't apply too much pressure here. You're kind of just flowing over the top nice and gently. And the same thing here with the desoldering wick. I'm not pressing into the board or else you'll cause delamination. You're just kind of floating across the top. Nice and slow, not applying too much pressure. 
And we'll do it one more time just to make sure we got all the remnants of the old lead-free solder. All right, that looks good. Spray this down with a little bit of alcohol and make sure we get all the flux residue off. And now we'll apply some fresh flux. All right, I think that looks good. Let's go ahead and pop on that new chip. Got to make sure this is aligned just right. A lot of the times it'll just fit right into the grooves and you'll know it snaps right in because it won't move from either the top or the bottom or the side to side. All right, looks like it's all done. We'll go ahead and let this thing cool down and then we'll hand it back to Nick. Now that we've installed the new chip, let's do a check for resistance and see if our short is still present. And we are now getting 9.48, 9.5 mega ohms. So that means the short is now gone and the TV should in theory now work. And actually before we do plug it in, I wanna make sure that there are no issues with any of the components here that could cause damage again. So real quick, we'll do a few checks on our capacitors. I wanna make sure there's no shorts. And none here, none here. And I am in beep mode. So when there is a short, there's a beep and no shorts here. So the, this is a, a zero ohm resistor. These are inductors, so they're supposed to be shorted, so that's fine. And then this resistor over here most likely failed open, so we're not gonna have any resistance. Right, and that's the case. Okay, so it is safe to plug in, and we'll come back maybe later to try and fix this, uh, or we might do a different video for that, depending on how involved this is. I just finished installing the main board back into the TV, and I also did plug in a fire stick into the HDMI port number four. As I had mentioned, often when we have power surges or lightning strikes, the HDMI processor can get affected, and even though we didn't find any shorts on it, I just wanna be sure. And the TV is turning on, so we're all set there. That means we've resolved one of the problems. And we're also gonna wanna do some checks on the internet, see if the Wi-Fi at least is still working. All right, so oh, it is detecting the Fire Stick, so it is booting in. We're gonna navigate to our menu. Okay, please wait, all right. So navigating down to the settings. Network settings, we're gonna double check the Wi-Fi. CenturyLink. Wi-Fi connected successfully, so we're in. Now that we've confirmed the Wi-Fi is working, we'll take the board back onto the bench and we're gonna try and fix that ethernet port and get it back up and running. Even though we didn't detect any shorts on the capacitors over here or this big one, they are looking a little bit damaged physically, so we're gonna replace them. And we're also gonna replace this resistor bank over here. So we'll remove first the components. They are a little bit burned, which is making it harder to make contact with the exposed pins. Now we'll remove all the excess solder. I grabbed a couple of our items from scavenger boards. We'll go ahead and install these parts. And right now I'm only soldering a little bit of these, one of the pads, just to get them locked in because they're very small and they easily fly off and they're very easy to lose. So I just want to lock them in. All right, perfect. And now I can add a little bit of flux everywhere to make it easier. And I'm actually also gonna switch over to a smaller tip. Oh, and I'm realizing my tip is actually not small enough to fit between the capacitor and the resistor, so I'm actually gonna have to probably remove that. 
So we're actually gonna use a little hot air because I have to remove that capacitor to then be able to properly solder on the resistor. All right. We have a little solder bridge here. There we go. And we're actually gonna use the hot air to finish up the job. If we're gonna do that, let's just do the capacitor at the same time. All right, so we're just gonna reflow essentially both the capacitor and the resistor bank here together. Can you bump me up to 400? All right, and I think I just got good flow here. I'm gonna add a little bit of solder on the other side of these caps. Ah, no. All right, we're gonna reflow those as well. Just gonna put a little fresh flux again. So as I'm doing this repair, uh, my tech one that I was watching pointed out, it looks like two of our traces here are actually completely gone. They've disappeared. Most likely they have actually burned up during the power surge or lightning strike. So we're gonna just do to confirm that they're just not blackened uh, and not still present, a beep mode check. So I'm gonna put one lead here and one lead here and we don't get a beep. We'll try over here. Still no beep, so there's no continuity. If we check over here with these guys, we do have a beep and we do have a beep. So these are good, but these two here are completely burnt off. Um, that's gonna be a lot more involved. For those of you that did see our trace repair video on the Vizio mainboard, you'll know how difficult that can be. So at this point, we're gonna have to stop the repair, get in contact with the customer and see if they want us to keep going because that's gonna have to be an extra charge at this point. Um, see if the Wi-Fi is good enough or if they absolutely need the ethernet port working. Um, but at this point, we'll have to stop the video. So if you did like the content, if you'd enjoyed the video, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I have a Sony XBR55X930D that is not turning on. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to diagnose the correct defective board and how to fix it on a component level. There's gonna be a little bit of soldering involved. If you don't have soldering equipment or don't know how to solder, don't worry, keep following along for the diagnostic and I'll have a mail-in option available in the description. Plugging in the TV right now, typically after a few seconds, uh, it does take a few seconds, but we should be seeing our standby light. Let me hit the power button as well. Let's take a look. And we still have nothing. And that is what we expected. Something else you can do is take a look at your optical lights. There is supposed to be a red light in there if everything's working properly. And right now it is not lit. So I'm not getting any power over here. Using the multimeter, we're gonna do a few voltage checks. So I am in DC volts. We're gonna use the chassis as our ground. And taking a look, I wanna make sure that my power brick is at least sending power to the TV. So just making contact here, it looks like we have a steady 24 volts. All right. Um, then what I can do is I can make sure that this board over here is also outputting the 24 volts. If I test this test point right here, it should be the 24 volt line output. And I still do have that 24 volt output. So I know that this board is sending the correct voltage to our DPS board. All right, so probing all of the wires going from the DPS board to the main board, not a single one of these lines has any voltages whatsoever. So what that tells us is our voltage stops at the DPS board and the main board is not even getting power. I just unplugged the TV from power and I've switched my multimeter over to beep mode. So when my leads detect a short, it beeps. Now let's take a look at the DPS board. 
Uh, zooming in a little closer here, there's a few things on the top right corner that we wanna focus on. The first thing we're gonna do is look at our fuse right over here, it's very small, and we're gonna make sure it's shorted. And it is. A shorted fuse is a good fuse, so that's good news. And then the other part that I wanna check is this IC chip right here. It is known to fail and short out. One way we can easily find if it is shorted is actually by checking the three capacitors to the right over here. And those three capacitors are shorted. That means we have a bad IC chip right here that'll need to be replaced. I'm going to get started by adding a little bit of solder to all of my pins, just to make it easier for desoldering when I'm going in with the hot air. And add a little flux. So this is gonna be my replacement IC. And if you take a look at the bottom, there is a ground pad. So I can't use just a soldering iron. I do have to use hot air for this type of repair. Okay, it looks like the solder is flowing on the pins. And right now we're at 320 degrees. The machine is still actually rising up to temperature. I have it set to 450, I believe. And let me see. Yep, so I just lift it off. Go ahead and turn that off. Move this out of the way. And I'm gonna quickly try to grab some of that solder while it's molten. And one thing we'll do is get those pads coated with a little extra solder. Okay. I'm gonna clean up the old flux residue that's left over. We'll wanna go ahead and put some new fresh flux on there. And then we're gonna line up our new chip. All right, and the IC is not perfectly placed right now, but that's okay. What's gonna happen is once I have the solder at a melting point, it'll actually bring the chip exactly to where it needs to be. I think we're reaching the melting point. Okay, that should be enough. And I'm just gonna touch up some of the pins with a little bit of extra solder. Some of the flux did already burn away, so I'm gonna add just a little more. It's a little bit tricky because we have a lot of capacitors and resistors very close to all of those pins, so you have to be very careful. I'm gonna rotate the board a little bit so I can get a better angle. Yeah, the camera is actually kind of getting a little bit in the way for the soldering, but we'll make it work here. All right, yeah, I think that should be good. All right, I'm gonna do a little bit of cleanup. And I'm just using 99.99% alcohol here. It should all evaporate in a second. Yep. Now that the chip is installed, we're gonna do another short check. So again, in beep mode, when my leads touch, that's a short and that beeps. So let's check those capacitors and we do not have a short anymore. So that means the short is gone. We have taken care of the issue and we can plug the board back into the TV. I just reinstalled the DPS board and looking at our output voltage to the main board, we are now getting our 24 volt output and also 
3.4 volt. Let's plug it in and see what we get. Let's see. So I don't actually have a stand, oh, here we go. It just turned on itself. Okay, so we have the Sony logo, the stand, there we go. Now the standby light is actually turning on, so it looks like it does take a second for it to appear. And then I just wanna show you as well that optical light down over here is showing a, a red light there as well. So that's another indicator that we're getting power everywhere. If you found the video useful, please leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Today I have a Sony 4K TV with model number XBR55X930D, and it seems to have no power issue. Now we did do a video recently with a DPS board failure, also no power, but this time around it's gonna be something a little bit different. I removed the back cover, and we're gonna jump into some voltage checks. So I'm using the chassis as ground, and the first check I wanna do is I wanna make sure we are getting power to the main board. So I wanna check my 24 volt line, and we are getting 24 volts. So we know that we have a good DPS board, and that's not our issue. However, we still don't have any power. I don't have a standby light, my optical light on my main board is not turning on, and because we are getting proper voltage coming from the DPS board, I know that our issue is going to be with the main board. So our next step here is actually going to disconnect the main board from circuit. We're not gonna do any more voltages on the main board right now. We're gonna do resistance checks. So let's go ahead and disconnect everything and take a look. If you have any issues removing this board out of your TV set, we'll have a video showing you exactly how to do that in the top right. Now before I start with my resistance checks, I'm actually gonna to need to remove this heatsink. I have four of these plastic pogo pins that we'll need to remove. I'm gonna flip the board over and with my needle nose pliers, I'm gonna pinch and push those through. All right, now that we've removed our heat sink, I'm going to do my resistance checks. Now there are very specific capacitors I'm going to be checking. The capacitors we want to specifically pay attention to are going to be these two over here, these two larger ones here, and then this one over here that's sideways. So in beep mode, with my leads touching the beep, indicating a short, we'll go ahead and do some checks. So both of these little ones are shorted. And these two larger ones are also shorted. And finally this one over here is also shorted. A proper measurement for these two small capacitors and this small capacitor is about four to five kilo ohms. For these two larger ones, I believe it's around 15 kilo ohms. So what we'll need to do is remove and replace our main processor chip. Once we've done that, we'll go ahead and recheck those capacitors and see what readings we get next. Before we proceed, I do wanna put a disclaimer out. This is not a very common issue. It is extremely rare for that processor chip to go bad. And if you're not seeing shorts, reflowing this processor will most likely not repair the board. In fact, more than likely, you're gonna damage the board further. Most often, especially if you're not getting those shorts that we just found, your EMMC is going to be the issue and will need to be replaced. In the near future, we'll have a video available for you in the top right corner. As you may have noticed, the BGA chip, which stands for a ball grid array, does not have any pins on the sides. So in order to properly desolder it, remove it, and replace it, we have to use what is called a rework machine. This rework machine is going to melt the solder that connects the chip to the board by melting them using heat from the top and the bottom at the same time. Okay, we've just reached our melting temperatures. So we're gonna be removing the chip now. And that's just a little bit of flux. We finished the cleaning process, so we're adding some fresh flux now. And now we're gonna also install our new chip, line it up as best we can. And we'll begin the reattachment process. Checking our capacitors again, we're no longer getting shorts. That first one, we're getting about four kilo ohms. 
and the larger ones, 5, 8, 10 kilo ohms. And lastly, the sideways one, we're also going to get about 4 kilo ohms is what we should get. I did clean off the old dried out thermal paste that was on there previously, and I'm going to put some new MX-4 thermal compound on our chip before we power it up. And then we're going to place our heatsink back on. And plug everything back in. All right, I've just installed the main board back into the TV. Let's go ahead and plug in and see what we get. It does take a second for it to turn on, so let's just be patient. Looks like it's not turning on, but most likely it's because I haven't hit the power button, so let's do that. And we do have our white standby light. I just saw a glow. There we go. We got a proper repair. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, if you found it helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. When I plug in my Sony 4K, I get no power. So let's open it up and find out why. We've already removed the back cover off of the TV set and have already done our voltage checks to rule out the power supply, our LED driver, and our DPS board. So we know those are good. And if you're not sure how to check it, you can always check out our video up here with more details. And our next step is gonna be voltage checks on our main board. So let's go ahead and do that. Using my multimeter in DC volts, I'm going to ground to the chassis ground my negative lead and do a couple voltage checks. So checking the white wire, which is the bottom one, I should have three and a half volts, which is our standby. And then on the fourth from the top, we should be getting 12 volts, which we are. So that's just a confirmation that we are getting proper power going to the main board. Our next step is to check our processor to see if it is shorted and the cause of our dead no power symptom. I've just removed the heatsink off of the main board and now I'm going to be doing some short checks on some of the capacitors right below. I'm in beep mode, so when I detect a short, we get that beep sound. Now, looking closer, we're gonna be checking these two over here and we get no beep, as well as these two larger ones with, again, no beep. And finally, this little one over here to the right. And again, no beep. Because we didn't find any shorts, we know that our processor chip is not the issue. This only leaves the EMMC chip as the only possible fault of our dead no power, since we again had proper voltages coming in from the DPS board. Let's go ahead and replace our EMMC chip and see what we get. We've reached our melting temperature and are ready to remove the chip. Cleaning off the old solder. We just reached our temperature and the chip has just attached itself to the board. We're now going to let the board cool off, and once it is cool, bring it back to the TV to live test. We just got the main board back into the TV, so let's plug it in and see what happens. And it does take a second for the TV to turn on, so let's be patient. And I'll go ahead and press the power button with the remote. And we do have our white standby light, which we did not have before and we have picture on screen. So it looks like the EMMC replacement did fix the TV and we have a proper repair. If you found the video useful or helpful, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. In today's video, I'm gonna be showing you how to transform this main board that belongs to a XBR75X940D into a main board for an XBR65X930D. If you take a look at the boards very closely, the only difference is just the type of heatsink that they use. Every other component on the board is identical. I just installed the main board back into the TV, so let's plug it in and see what happens. We're getting the amber green light on the standby light at the bottom of the TV, which means the main board is not paired to the TV itself, so we're gonna have to do that. For those of you that don't know how to do that, we'll have a link in the top right. It looks like the pairing procedure is not taking. We still have the amber green. We tried a few different times, 
and no matter what we do, it just goes back to the amber green. So what we're gonna do is an EMMC repair. The reason we're gonna do that is because number one, we want to convert this board into the 65 inch 930D version. And we do need to replace the MMC with that type of software in order to do the conversion. And secondly, if this issue is due to a fault with the main board, because we don't actually know if that main board was good or not, the EMMC would be the repair we would need to do in order to fix it. So let's go ahead and do that and then we'll plug it back in the TV. Now that we've replaced the EMMC and reinstalled it in the TV, let's power it on and see what we get. So it's turning on, which means that the EMMC conversion did work. And now we have a XBR 65X 930D mainboard, even though originally it was a 75X 940D. So let's go ahead and do a little bit more testing, make sure everything works. All right, so it's actually not recognizing that anything's plugged in. Typically when there is something plugged into the HDMI, you'll get a little sign or a logo next to it indicating it's plugged in, but I'm not getting anything. So that means this board still has a problem. We have an HDMI failure, so let's go ahead and take care of that. With the main board on the test bench under the microscope, we're gonna be doing short checks around the HDMI processor. We have this Silicon Image brand HDMI processor that typically shorts out. And as always, we don't usually pull up the schematics to find out exactly which pins to check. An easier way to do it is we just check capacitors around the IC to see if they are shorted or not. Um, based off of another good board that we had, we're expecting to have about 50 ohms on a lot of the capacitors around the, uh, the chip. So if I check this one, I believe it was showing 10 ohms earlier. And right now it's actually showing 5.3 ohms, which is much too low. We'll check another one over here and see what we get on this one. Let's see. Oops. Uh, I keep slipping. Okay, and that one's 5.8, 6. So that is also much too low. That means that the uh, IC chip is shorted. And as we can tell, this is our ground side, let me, on this side. And of course this side then goes to this pin over here. So that pin is shorted. Let's go ahead and remove the silicon image and we'll do some more checks afterwards. And this is a pretty big chip. So I'm gonna use bottom heat and I'll add some flux as well. And because the chip is so big, it doesn't really fit in the camera uh, all the way. So this is the best what we got. All right, that got real smoky. You gotta be very careful with these because there's tons of little capacitors and resistors right next to these traces. Now we're just gonna clean up the old flux off the board. Before we put our new chip on, we're gonna do a second check of the capacitors. So back in resistance, let's take a look. So now we're getting kilo ohms, 19 kilo ohms. Oh, and I'm getting 19 kilo ohms as well. So when we put the new chip back on, the resistance should actually come back down to about 50 ohms or so. And that's gonna be what we're looking for. That's our target. So I of course forgot the orientation of the chip, but I think I'm seeing a little dot over in the top left corner, which would indicate the pin one and I have a little dot uh, over here on my silicon image. So I'm gonna guess that this is the correct orientation, but to be sure, we're gonna check off of a picture on the internet, or actually off of that other board I have. Okay, yep, so that is the correct orientation, but before I place it, I actually do have to add a little bit of solder paste. And as always, I put way too much. Go ahead and remove some of that. 
And that should be good. Let's see, is that... Uh, almost, not quite. You definitely want to make sure that it's lined up as best as possible. And let's see if up top we're still good. All right, and we've about reached temperature, so we can go ahead and hit it with some hot air. Whoops. And I'm just poking at it right now to make sure that the solder is nice and cool, which it is. The chip is no longer moving, so now we can go ahead and start soldering the sides. Alright, I, I don't think this tip is actually going to work out. Uh, I can't even make any movements without either knocking off a component or just a component getting in the way that I can't actually properly solder. So we're going with a smaller tip and see if that works a little bit better. One of the issues I'm, I'm experiencing right now is I can get solder on the pins, but I'm having a hard time getting solder on the pad that is below the pin because so little of it is exposed. And because this is also a scavenge chip, I think some of the pins are a little bit bent from when I removed it. And so they're not actually making contact with the with the board, with the pad below the pins. All right. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm actually pushing the pins in as I'm soldering. And it seems to be working so far. At least I'm getting better success. The thing that's pretty good, just have now this blob of solder we need to get rid of. gonna bring it all the way over to the corner and maybe I can get rid of it off of it. There we go. Perfect. So now with one of the scraping tools I'm gonna go over each pin and make sure that all of them are properly making contact. And it looks like that's the case. There's just one little spot right here that kind of looks bridged. Let's clean it up a little bit more. No, we're okay. It was that last pin in the corner, but I think that's just flux, so we're all right. Okay, let's go ahead and do the same thing again, but to the other three corners now. Oh, looks like I bent a pin. We're gonna have to fix that. So what I'm gonna do is melt the solder with the iron and then with this very fine tip needle, I'm gonna push the leg so it's back to centered on the pad. There we go. I finished soldering the last two corners and I did my pin check with the dental tool. So we're gonna do our last resistance, resistance check in ohms mode and we're gonna stick with the same ones. Whoops. All right, and what do we get? So right now we get 33 ohms and over here, Twenty-seven ohms, so it's going down just because I still have the the board is a little hot. But um, I'm told by my tech about thirty to forty ohms is what we're expecting. 
but the important thing is we're not getting the 10 ohms that we were getting before. So this chip should be good and we'll go ahead and now plug it back in and do a live check. All right, so final live check, we'll plug it in and see what we get here. All right, HDMI one. Yeah, all right. So it is working. So we have a 75X 940D now converted to a 55 or 65X 930D with perfect working HDMIs. If you found the video helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. The most common symptoms we see with the Sony 4K LED TVs are completely dead, doesn't power on but has a loud buzzing sound, boot looping, which is the most common symptom we see with these Sony TVs. You will see the Sony logo turn on and then off and cycle back on. Sometimes it'll boot past the Sony logo into the Android logo, then it'll shut off and cycle back on. And finally, it'll sometimes boot all the way into the TV, we'll play for a minute or so, and then shut off and cycle back on. We also commonly see the TV turning on, but it'll show green and pink bars coming across the screen. HDMI port malfunctions can also occur. And finally, blink codes. The most common blink codes we see with this TV are six, seven, and eight, and those are the blink codes we'll cover in this video. We are using an XBR 65X 850E, but this diagnostic will also apply to the 55, 75 inch models, as well as the 900E series. If you have this TV or a similar model with different symptoms, let us know in the comments below. Let's start by covering the blink codes. A six blink error code is typically due to an LED failure. In order to resolve that issue, you will have to replace the LED strips. A seven blink error code is due to a temp error on the main board, and an eight blink error code is due to a software failure on the main board. However, we've also seen an eight blink code be due to faulty ribbons. An HDMI malfunction will also be due to a main board failure, as well as the green and pink lines on screen. In this situation, you will have to completely replace the processor as a reflow or reball will not be enough to fix the issue. Now, if you've just replaced your main board and then you get the color pattern test, most likely it's because you did not connect in the two ribbons that connect the main board to the TCON correctly, in which case I would encourage you to disconnect them and reconnect them. If that does not resolve the color pattern test issue, then it is possible your ribbons are damaged and will need to be replaced as well. Now, to the more common symptoms. Dead, no power, but we do get a buzzing sound from the power supply. If that's the case, then your power supply has failed and will need to be repaired or replaced. If you do not get a buzzing sound and you don't get any power, that can still be a power supply issue. However, most often that will be a mainboard related problem. For more troubleshooting tips to understand if your power supply or if your mainboard is at fault for a dead, no power, check out our video in the top right corner. And finally, the most common issue we see with these TV sets is boot looping. The boot looping failure is always going to be caused by your main board. So whether you're seeing the Sony logo and it's shutting off, if you're seeing the Sony logo, the Android logo, and then shutting off, or if it plays fine for a few minutes and then shuts off and cycles back on, that will always be a main board failure. If you have any questions, or if we did not cover your symptoms in this video, make sure to leave us a comment and let us know below. We'll also have videos linked at the end with more details on mainboard and power supplies. If you found this video helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Let's go ahead and plug it in now that that cover's off. And if you listen closely, we get a little buzzing sound. So I'm gonna disconnect the TV from power and we're gonna do some resistance checks with the multimeter. In ohms mode, I'm going to be doing resistance checks on these four diodes. These are the more common failing parts on this power supply. And this first one is showing about 1.9 kilo ohms. This second one down here, 43 kilo ohms. And this one zero, so this one is shorted. And this one also appears to be showing as short. So we're gonna go ahead and take the power supply out of the TV and bring it to the soldering bench. We're gonna go ahead and remove these four diodes. Flipping the board over, we have the four joints right here. Or sorry, eight joints. I'm gonna start by adding extra solder to each joint. And now with my pliers, on one side, I'm going to be removing and pulling the diode out while melting the joint on the other side. Now one of the legs is removed. Okay, and that's my first diode. Now that I've removed my four diodes, I'm gonna do another check and confirm that my shorts are gone. So in resistance,
we're getting OL, which means there is uh, open loop. So our shorts are definitely gone. So checking our diodes, I do have one of them is shorted. And looking at the other three, we don't have a dead short. So what that means is out of the four, only one of them was actually our issue. But of course, we do want to replace all four because replacing only the one might mean that the other three could fail in the near future. And then using my desolder pump, I'm now going to clean up all the joints. Now, if you can't get one of the holes nice and clear, sometimes it's actually a good idea to add a little bit more new solder. Now, I'm going to be installing my new replacement diodes and I've already pre-bent the pins so that they fit properly in the slots. All right, all four new diodes are in circuit. So let's go ahead and solder those in now. And now we'll just cut off the excess and finally do a little bit of cleanup with some 99.99% alcohol. And the board looks good as new. Let's go ahead and put it back in the TV and see if everything works. And one thing I want to note is I'm not hearing the buzzing sound and I just heard a click as well. So let's take a look at the screen. Sure enough, look at that. We got a proper repair. So it looks like we have fixed the power supply. If you liked the video, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I have a Sony model XBR 75X 850F and it has no power. So when I try to power it on, we get no standby light whatsoever. So let's open it up and find out why. I've just removed the back cover. If you don't know how to do that, you can check out the video in the top right. Otherwise, let's get started with some voltage checks on the power supply. All right, we're gonna start by plugging it in. And over here on this main connector here. So I'm first gonna start by getting my standby voltage. That's the first one I wanna check for, which is gonna be pin number five. So over here, pin one is at the top, but it's the bottom row. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So that's gonna be our third one down. And that's 3.49. So we do have our standby. Next, I'm gonna to wanna to check on our 12 volt lines, which are pins 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Okay, and I'm checking pin number 14 right now, and we do have our 12 volts. These are all in parallel, so if one of them has 12 volts, that means the rest do as well. I also wanna check our TCON 12 volts, which that's gonna be pins 25, 27, and 28. And I do know this is a 28 pin connector, so I can check this one, which would be pin 27, and that one does not have any voltage. So we don't have any TCON on voltage right now. I'm trying to determine whether or not the lack of 12 volts to the TCON is because of a defective power supply, or maybe it's because the main board is not sending the command for the 12 volts to go to the TCON. So what we're gonna do is trick the power supply into getting that command and see if we can get that 12 volts. So to do that, I'm gonna unplug our power here. And we're also going to actually disconnect our TCON board and the main board. And going back to this connector here, we're gonna do some jumping around on some voltages. So earlier we were looking at our standby, which is pin number five. So it's the third one on the bottom row. I'm gonna insert my jumper here and we're gonna steal the power from that line and give it to the power on line, which is the pin number nine which is gonna be this one. And then we're also going to give power to the TCON on, which is pin number 26 over here. I'm gonna plug this back in. So right now, just to reiterate, we have our backlight, or sorry, we have our TCON on, we have our power on that are jumped to our standby voltage. So now let's go ahead and plug it back in. And keep in mind, again, we have the main board and TCON disconnected. Now, if we take a look at our TCON on voltage, or sorry, our regular TCON voltage, we do now have our 12 volts. That does clarify that the issue is not coming from the power supply. It's simply the main board is not sending that command. With this TV, there are two different circuit boards that could cause a no power issue that we're experiencing, the power supply board and the main board. Because we were able to get all of the correct output voltages going to the main board and the TCON with our bypass, we know that by default the power supply is not the issue and thus the main board has to be the cause.
There are two parts on this mainboard that fail and can cause the symptoms we're experiencing. Number one would be the main processor under the white heatsink, which is the least likely of the two and more commonly is the EMMC, which is the chip right here. The processor, however, I can check using my multimeter, using the resistance mode, checking to see if there are any shorts in the surrounding areas. When removing the heatsink, you do wanna be somewhat gentle. So I'm gonna be pinching the clip here with my pliers, needle nose, and then gently pushing it through. We'll go ahead and repeat that four more times. If you put too much pressure and warp the board, you could actually cause some damage to the circuit board. So you wanna be very gentle. Now that we've removed the heatsink from the main board, we can go ahead and do some of our resistance checks. So looking at these capacitors first on the left, we have 97 kilo ohms, and, and we're really just looking for shorts. So typically I'm, I'm looking for like 10, 15, 100 kilo ohms. And there's not necessarily any one in specific that I'm looking at. I'm looking at a bunch of them and I just wanna make sure none of them are shorted. 33 kilo ohms, 5.7, also 5.7, 13.8, 12, 23, this one's showing me OL. Okay, well that's not a short. Actually, this one I think is also in parallel. Yep, so same OL, 11.7. And we'll do just a couple more on this side. That's 23, 33, then OL. And then finally these two, 1.68 kilo ohms. And that one is 1.7 kilo ohms. Right, so no shorts. Um, I don't believe that our processor is defective. So at this point, what I would like to do is replace our EMMC chip down here and then see what we get after that. I've just installed the repaired main board back in the TV set, so let's go ahead and plug it in and see what we get. And I actually just heard the power supply click, which we did not before. And now we get our amber and green light. So if you don't know how to handle the amber green, check out the video on the top right. We have a full video showing you how to deal with that. I'm gonna be plugging in my pre-programmed flash drive, which once again, if you don't know how to do it, check out that video. And now we're plugging it in again. Let's take a look. And it looks like the pairing is happening because I have my white slowly pulsing lights. So at this point, we'll have to wait about an hour or so and come back to it. After we ran the update, we actually had an error. The TV would not turn on at all. And we had a solid blue ultraviolet light appear on the standby light. So what we did was we replaced the flash drive with a new one, tried it again, and now it's booting up. So taking a look at the screen, we now have our initial setup with the welcome and language selection. If you have a main board with completely dead or cycling issues that you need to send in for repair, we'll have information in the description below. If you found the video helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. We're about to deep dive into a full diagnostic for this Sony TV. This TV is completely dead, so let's rule out each part until we find the culprit. With Sony sets, we most commonly see mainboard failures. To confirm this, let's check our output voltage from the power supply. The first thing I wanna check is our standby voltage, which is 3.3 volts, and that is correct. It is our third pin down on the bottom row. And then we wanna check our 12 volt line, which is pins 11 through 18. I can check any of them because they are in parallel and we are getting 12.8, so that's also correct. So at this point, we've confirmed we are getting our 12 volts and 3.8 three volts standby from the power supply to the main board. Our next step is to check a little further down the line and we wanna focus on the EMMC chip over here. The EMMC is the memory chip of the TV. So if it's not getting power, that would be a problem. We're looking for 1.8 and 3.3 volts. We should be getting 3.3 from these two capacitors up here and we are and 1.8 from these two down here and we also are. Since we are getting power to the chip, our next step is to confirm if the chip itself is defective. For this next step, I'm gonna pass the board over to my tech Juan. All right, in order to test the functionality of the EMMC, we first must remove it from the board, and then we're gonna go ahead and install it in our EMMC testing jig. All right, that's gonna take five minutes, so let's go ahead and check back in with Nick. With the main board out of circuit, I'd like to do a full functionality check on the power supply. So first, let's recheck our 3.3 volts 
and we're getting about 3.5, so that's our standby, it is present, and the 12 volts is no longer present. I also like to check the TCON 12 volts, which is all the way down here, and we also have zero volts. And that's because the main board is no longer in circuit to send the signal on commands to the power supply. So our next step is to provide 3.3 volts to all of the on command lines. So in order to get the 3.3 volts to the command lines, we're gonna steal it from the standby voltage line. So I'm gonna put my jumper there. I'm gonna apply the 3.3 volts to the power on line right over here. That'll give us our normal 12 volts. We want our TCON on command line to be activated. So we'll put one right here, TCON on. And lastly, we want our backlight on, which is pin two. Now that we have our connector all set up, we can power back on. And I'm noticing the backlight is on, so something's working here. But we're gonna still do some voltage checks. So with the multimeter, let's check our TCON voltage now. And we're getting 12.7, our regular 12 volts over here, and we're getting 12.8. So all of the output voltages that we're expecting from the power supply are present. Let's do a couple of checks on the output voltages to the driver board. I do believe they're gonna be there since our LEDs are on and we're getting 35 volts. Again, these are all in parallel. So if one of them works, all of them will show that 35 volts. So we're all set there. And let's take a quick look at the screen. Because we're now able to get our color pattern test, that does confirm that every part in the TV, the screen, T-Con, power supply, LED driver, and the LEDs are all fully functional. So that confirms the main board must be the fault. So let's check back in with Juan and see where we're at. Looks like we're just about at temperature, so we're ready to remove the chip. All right, we can now put the MMC in our socket and we can check the condition. Well, it looks like the EMMC is in pristine condition. However, the software looks like it might be corrupted. So as we've determined that the software is corrupted, we're gonna go ahead and install a fresh factory reset version of our software onto the chip. All right, it looks like it's finished writing all the partitions. Go ahead and take this EMMC out of here and reinstall it on the board. All right, the main board's back in the TV, so let's power it on and see what we get. While I was getting our flash drive ready for the pairing, I noticed that our TV turned on. So we are still getting the amber green, which means the TV should not be turning on because the main board is not paired to the set, but it is. So we're gonna go ahead and pair it anyways and see what we get next. So we just finished the pairing and we're no longer getting the amber and green. So it looks like we have a successful repair. If you enjoyed the content, if you liked the video, make sure to leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. We have this completely dead Sony OLED. So we'll start by powering it up and do some basic voltage checks. There are two boards that commonly cause a no power symptom, the power supply over here and our main board over here. So those are the two we're gonna be looking at more closely. So I'm gonna start by measuring my standby voltage, which is the third pin from the top over here. And we should be getting about 3.3. We have 3.46, that's close enough. We're gonna check our 12 volt line, which is the last four pins on the top row. And we have 12 volts. So if one of those pins has 12 volts, then the other three will also have 12 volts since they're in parallel. So this confirms our power supply is providing power to the main board. So our next step is troubleshooting the main board further. There are two common faults that we typically see. Number one would be a processor fault, which is underneath the black heatsink. And number two would be our memory IC, the EMMC, which is located just down here. Now, typically the EMMC won't be receiving any power if the processor has failed and shorted out. So we're gonna check for voltages around the EMMC and that'll tell us which part has failed. We're looking for our 3.3 volts and 1.8. So let's start by checking some of the capacitors next to the EMMC. And we are getting 3.3 and down here 1.79, which is our 1.8. Because our EMMC is getting power, I do believe our processor is okay and our EMMC has most likely failed. Our next step is to remove the main board so that we can replace the EMMC chip. All right, Juan, I have another EMMC replacement if you wouldn't mind doing that for me. How about you do it this time? Uh, okay, you're gonna have to show me. All right, go ahead and show you. So before I put the main board onto the machine, is there any prep work I need to do? Yeah, I would advise that you remove this heat sink right here. I have four pins. Let me use these needle nose pliers. All right, there we go. Heat sink removed. Anything else I need to do for the prep? No, that should be it. Okay, perfect. Anything I should know about the orientation? No, that works. Laser. There. Do I need to put any flux or any chemicals on the top? No. No? All right. And how far down do I go? Just all the way? Yeah, that'll be fine. Right at the bottom, the lowest setting. All right, here we go. 
So is this your first BGA, Nick? It's not my first BGA, but it's been quite a while. All right, I've been advised to put on some gloves so that I don't get flux all over my fingers. All right, so before we get to temperature, I know you press a few buttons for this guy. It's just the vacuum. That'll be the, the vacuum right there. All right, and that'll activate. And of course you hold, you hold, it's right there. Ah, then, uh, so you're gonna wanna do Stop. Well, there we have it. We'll have to do it a second time. All right, so there's no harm in me pressing vacuum now. No, you can do it. All right, I'm gonna do that. Now that's ready. Okay, this time, constants. Move this away. Oh, baby, let's go. And now you're gonna need some flux. With the desolder wick. I'm gonna do a second pass. I've been informed I didn't properly clean it, so we need to desolder a little bit more. Now we get to test the EMMC to make sure it's defective. All right, we have our easy JTAG. I see an arrow here, so that's pin one, and I don't see a pin one on here. Looks so like that? Yep. All right, so I do easy JTAG E socket, yep, and, and then just check. Yeah. Advanced and smart report. Smart report. Ooh, ten percent lifetime used. It could mean that the chip is good, but the software is bad, or we completely misdiagnose the mainboard and it is a processor, even though we do get voltages. Our EMMC programmer slash tester is not able to detect any sort of software fault, and it is not detecting any sort of hardware fault either. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a software fault. So we're gonna go ahead and replace the EMMC anyways, which Juan has let me know he's already pre-programmed one. So let's go ahead and install that next. Whoa, that's way too much. That's okay. Okay, so we're flipping it over. If you take a look at the EMMC, there's one extra solder ball around that ring in the inside. On the bottom corner, left yeah, corner here. So you wanna match that to the board. That's centered correctly. And away we go. Yes, sir. All right, main board's installed back into the set. Let's power it on. I'm gonna go ahead and press the power button. I see an optical light. I have standby at the bottom. I don't have picture yet. I don't have picture yet. I have picture. We have picture. All right, if you found the video helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe and thanks for watching. I'm gonna show you exactly how to diagnose and fix this Sony TV. When I plug it in, I get no power, no standby light. So first step, let's open it up. If you're not sure how, we'll have a back cover removal video in the link description below. So the first thing we're gonna do is confirm and make sure that our power supply is fully functional. I have it plugged in and I'm currently doing a voltage check on pin number nine, which is our power on line. And we are getting 3.4 volts DC. Another line I'm gonna be checking is our 12 volts, which is going to be connector pin gonna be pins 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So we can check any of those. So I'll check, I think this one is 14. And we do get our 12 volts. And then lastly, the other voltage line I'm wanting to check is gonna be our TCON on voltage, which that is going to be, or sorry, not the TCON on voltage, but the TCON voltage, which is pins 25, 27, and 28. So let's check this one is 28. And I'm supposed to be getting 12 volts and I'm not. Let's go ahead and power it down. So what I'm gonna do next is remove the main board out of circuit and then put in this homemade connector, which is going to trick the power supply into thinking everything is supposed to turn on so that hopefully we can get our TCON 12 volts and make sure that the power supply is providing that voltage. The lines I have shorted together here are the standby voltage, which is pin number five. I have the power on, which is pin number nine, and then the TCON on, which is pin number 26. So I'm gonna plug in my connector. Again, main board's completely disconnected. So let's power back on. And I just heard the power supply click actually. And let's do another check for our TCON voltage, which is the 12 volts. And we now get our 12 volts for the TCON. All right, that confirms that our power supply is outputting all the correct voltages going to the main board. And yet the main board is not turning on. So next step is let's check out the main board. Again, if you're not sure how to remove your mainboard, we'll have a video down in the description below. Now we're gonna be removing the heatsink here. On the back side, we have four little clips we're gonna be pinching and pushing through. This is our first one. 
our second, our third, and our final and fourth. So this is our main processor, and the reason we removed the heatsink is so that we can check some of the capacitors that are very small and all around it. And what we're going to be doing is checking them for shorts. One side of the capacitors is going to be ground, and the other side is going to be connecting to a trace that connects to the underside of this processor. So in order to essentially check if the processor is shorted, we're going to be checking the capacitors that are connected directly to it. The reason we're doing this is because we obviously can't check the traces that are between the, the PCB and the processor itself. We obviously can't get our leads in the middle there. So this is why we're doing it this way. And I'm just in beep mode. I'm just looking for dead shorts. So if the multimeter beeps, that means we have a short. So no shorts here. No shorts. No shorts. And I don't think I checked this one. All right. Uh, okay, no shorts. So I just checked uh, a few random capacitors all around the chip and no shorts were found. So odds are very low that this is actually our fault, which means most likely the culprit is this EMMC chip. So I'm gonna be passing the main board over to Juan to replace the EMMC chip. Here you go, Juan. Ah, well, thank you. I've installed the main board back into the TV, so let's plug it in and see what we get. I also did get our Fire Stick in HDMI 1, and I heard it click, and we have our Sony logo. Uh, and it should go to the HDMI 1 because that is the factory default software that we have installed on the MMC. And there we go. So it looks like our HDMI's are working and fixed. It looks like the TV is fully functional. If you found the video helpful or useful, leave us a like and subscribe, and thanks for watching. A TV shop contacted us to fix a high-end OLED TV with no power. It's completely dead. Oh, and also, it was hit by lightning. Normally, they would have purchased new boards, but for this model, there are none available for sale. So if we can't fix this board for their customer, they're gonna have to toss out their $2,000 TV. Now they sent us their main board, not power supply. Most lightning strikes and power surges affect the main board. Now I don't have a TV to live test this main board in, which is a problem we'll tackle in a bit. For now, let's take a look at it under the microscope and see if there's anything obvious. Oop, how did I get there? Looking more closely, we can see the power surge came in through the ethernet port and burned up several traces, as well as a couple of capacitors. Often the damage is not localized. If we follow those traces, they go up, 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 and then underneath this heatsink. So let's remove the heatsink and see where those traces go. Oh, sorry, I don't know how that keeps getting there. All right, if we keep following the traces, they go up to this processor. There is a high chance that our processor is actually shorted. So let's take a look with our multimeter. Here are our readings. Here are the readings we are supposed to see. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. So clearly we have some shorts on the processor, so our first step should be to replace it and get rid of those shorts. Juan, can I have you replace the processor chip on this board? This is a BGA type processor, which stands for ball grid array. In simple terms, it means the processor is attached to the circuit board via hundreds of little solder balls. We have to use our rework machine in order to remove that processor. The rework machine will simultaneously heat up the processor from the top and the circuit board from the bottom until we reach that solder's melting point. Only then can we very carefully remove the processor. Now, while the machine is warming up, let's go figure out how we're gonna test this board after repairs. Now, I don't have a TV to live test this main board, but I think we can build one using parts from our test jigs. Luckily, the 2018, 19, and 2020 OLED Sony's all use almost identical power supplies. So we can use the one from this test jig in order to test our customer's mainboard. Now that we have our power, we have to figure out how we're gonna turn on the mainboard. So I need either an infrared sensor or buttons. Unfortunately, none of our other test jigs have compatible ones, so I had to buy an infrared sensor and ribbon from eBay. Lastly, we will need picture, so we'll have to figure out a solution for a screen. But first, let's check in with Juan and see where we are with the repair. All right, just wanna check in on the board. How are we doing? Well, it just beeps, so it's ready to remove the chip. But first, we're gonna prod it 
to make sure that all the solder joints are liquidous. And it looks like they are. So now we're going to want to be careful because we don't want to impact the board too much or else some of the components might fall off on the bottom or we might have some bridging. And there we go, there's a nice clean lift. Now we can remove the old solder left behind and clean up any burnt flux residue. Flux is a chemical we use to help solder flow more evenly, making both the process easier and increasing the chance of a good bond between the PCB and the component you are installing. We now add fresh flux and can begin the attachment process. Thank you. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. We've now confirmed we no longer have any shorts on the board, so we can go ahead and live test it. So we have our main board in our testing jig. We still don't have a way to get picture, but first I want to make sure all of my power and IR connect, which they do. And for our picture, we need LVDS ribbons. They typically connect on the other side to the T-Con, but this time I have a little bit of a cheat. My T-Con board is going to be this adapter that then connects to this universal screen, our main board tester. So that's what we're going to be using. Let's plug in our TV to power. Okay, we have our Sony logo here. Now we have our Android logo pop up. And finally, we are on our home screen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in this HDMI over here and we're gonna go to the inputs. All right, and it looks like we do have picture now. And our last step would be to replace the ethernet port and some of the damaged components here, but we're gonna go ahead and do that off screen. It looks like we were able to save yet another TV from the landfill. If you like the content, make sure to leave us a like and subscribe. Hi, this is Nick with Nick's TV Repair. In this video, I will show you how to properly pair your Sony mainboard with your TV set. We will also go over all the known issues that may occur during the installation and how to resolve them. For the purpose of this video, we have already installed the mainboard back into the TV. For any questions regarding the installation, click the link in the top right corner of the screen. Okay. Step one, let's plug in the TV and see what happens. On occasion, your board will work first try and will not require to be paired with your set. Most often, we do expect the pilot light to flash an amber and green color, indicating the main board requires pairing to the T-Con and screen. If this is the case, simply disconnect the TV from power, insert the USB flash drive we have provided, and plug in the set once again. Let's wait at least 10 to 15 seconds for the pilot light to turn on. I am noticing our flash drive does have a red light, indicating it is getting power. Unfortunately, we are getting another amber-green color from the pilot light. If the pilot light turns to a white pulsing light, then the pairing process has begun. You must not disconnect power, attempt to turn on or off the TV while the white light is pulsing. If you do so, the module will break and you will need to send it back for additional repairs. If the pilot light still flashes an amber and green light, however, the pairing procedure did not take, in which case we will want to disconnect the power and try again. We will want to try this at least three times. If this does not work by the third try, the next step is to disconnect your LVDS ribbons and reconnect them. You may think your LVDS ribbons are properly connected, however the slightest misalignment can cause improper contact and thus hinder communication between the main board, the T-Con, and the panel. Once the LVDS ribbons are reconnected, we'll want to repeat the process at least three more times or until the pairing procedure occurs. If the amber green persists, the next step would be to erase the flash drive and re-download the software directly from the Sony website. On the Sony.com website homepage, type in your TV model number in the search bar. Under Narrow Your Results, select the Sport option. Below the model number, click on the Downloads button and then select your model once again. Now select the Firmware Update link and click on the Download button at the top of the page. Scroll to the bottom of the page and select the Download button one last time. Once the file is downloaded, you will need to extract the file. We use 7-zip in our example and recommend you use the same extracting tool as it is recommended by Sony. 
Extract the file to the same folder and open your USB flash drive. You will want to drag and drop the extracted file into the USB flash drive folder. Once completed, you may eject the USB flash drive. Now that we've downloaded the software from the Sony website, we will go through the pairing process once again. With power unplugged, let's insert the flash drive. We'll go ahead and insert the power cable back in. And as mentioned previously, it will take 10 to 15 seconds for the pilot light to start illuminating. The pairing procedure is not taking, so we'll go ahead and disconnect and reconnect and try a second time. And let's go ahead and do that a final third time. Now, if the pairing procedure does not take on the third try, an alternative option is to let the set rest for six to eight hours with the flash drive connected and power connected. Generally, after that six to eight hour period, the update will have processed through. And when you come back, the TV will actually have already completed the pairing process. At that point, the amber green should no longer be flashing and you can go ahead and turn on the TV sets and see the home screen. Once you do so, only then will you want to remove the flash drive. If the amber green light is still flashing after that six to eight hour period, in that case, let's go ahead and remove the flash drive and bring it back to the computer. Insert the USB flash drive back into your computer and open the flash drive folder. Select the file and rename it to upgrade underscore loader. Close the folder and eject the USB flash drive. Now that we have renamed the file to upgrade loader.package, we'll go ahead and try one more time. We'll insert the flash drive, as always with the power disconnected first. We'll go ahead and plug that in. And once again, we'll wait the 10 to 15 seconds for the pilot light to start flashing. The pairing procedure is now working. We do have that slowly flashing white light. And as mentioned earlier, it is imperative we do not press the power button on the remote, on the side buttons, disconnect the TV from power, or remove the flash drive. Okay, there are two scenarios that can occur from this point regarding the pairing. Either the procedure will take a full hour and the TV will turn on and display the home screen once completed, or the procedure will take 30 minutes and the pilot light will flash an amber and green color once again. If the latter of the two occurs, then the pairing process will need to be completed a second time. Simply disconnect the power from the set and reconnect. The second part of the pairing procedure should begin immediately. If it does not, simply disconnect the power once again and reconnect. After the second portion of the pairing procedure is completed, the TV will turn on with proper picture on screen. Once and only once the TV turns on and displays the home screen can you disconnect the USB flash drive. Now we will show you a few issues that can occur after we have properly completed the pairing procedure. If the color and pattern test appears on screen, this means the LVDS ribbons are either damaged or improperly connected. If the pairing process is occurring at the same time, you must wait for the update to complete. Only once the update is completed can you disconnect the TV from power and reconnect your ribbons. Once again, if you are unsure how to properly connect your LVDS ribbons, please click on the installation guide video at the top right portion of the screen. Once this is done, you may apply the power back to the TV. If the TV does not automatically turn on after 20 seconds or begin the pairing procedure, then you may press the power button. The TV should turn on and display the home menu screen if the pairing was successful. If the backlight turns on, the audio works but no picture can be seen on screen, press and hold the power button until the TV turns off. This will take about 10 to 15 seconds as well. The TV will reboot and start blinking amber green once more. After a short period of time, the update procedure will begin. For this step specifically, we do not want to disconnect the power. The update will begin automatically. If you just installed your mainboard in your 4K XBR Sony TV and you're getting an orange and green flashing light, this is what you need to do to resolve that issue. 
If you purchased a repair service for a mainboard from our website, we will have already provided you with this flash drive for the pairing procedure. If you have not and you bought a replacement online, then you won't have this flash drive, but I'll show you right now how to get the files programmed onto this flash drive. On the sonysupport.com website, you're gonna enter your model number in the search bar, XBR-55X930D in our case, enter. Then the downloads button, the firmware update button, and then click on the downloads again, scroll all the way down, and finally download again. Now the software is downloading to your computer. You're gonna to want to extract it to your flash drive and make sure it's a four gigabytes at least flash drive. This process is gonna take a minute or so. Once it is completed, we're gonna rename it to upgrade underscore loader dot PKG. So whatever it is currently named, delete that and write in U-P-G-R-A-D-E underscore loader, L-O-A-D-E-R dot PKG. Then you can close it out remove the flash drive and bring it back to the TV. If you're having issues programming your flash drive, we do have them available for sale pre-programmed. I'm simply gonna be installing the flash drive in any of the three USB ports here. And then I'm gonna plug in the TV. If you take a look, the flash drive will start flashing a red light and that will indicate that the pairing procedure is starting. In addition, the white light at the bottom will also slowly start pulsing. Let's flip the screen around to show you that pulsing I'm talking about. It looks like the pairing just completed and the TV turned back on. It looks like it's currently on the uh, initial setup screen. So at this point, we can go ahead and safely remove our flash drive. Uh, it is very important that you do not prematurely remove the flash drive or disconnect the TV from power. If you do that, you will break the main board and you'll have to either replace it or send it in for repair. If you found the video useful, please leave us a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.